Russia's military is making advances in Ukraine, but has suffered significant casualties since invading two weeks ago. For more, I want to bring in Jason Beardsley. Jason is a national security expert and national executive director at the Association of the U.S. Navy. He's also a former Green Beret. Jason, it's great to have you. As you know, Russia's military is significantly larger than Ukraine's, but still these casualties are staggering. How might the impact morale of Russian troops? Uh, thank you for having me. It, it impacts the morale tremendously. And I think David Martin laid out a great case. In 20 years in Iraq, you know, we, we lost uh, six, 7,000 or so. And here they are at about six, and it's probably higher than that. This has really ripped through the Russian army. The morale there is low. There's a lot of conscripts that were in this engagement without knowing they were going to war. Uh, those are the reports on the ground. They appear to be true. In addition to that, we can tell by the readiness of the machines, the equipment, the vehicles, they were not prepared for this. They're they're finding themselves without gasoline, without food, without you know comfort and aid and enemy territory. And the Ukrainians have been used to fighting. Bear in mind, for since 2014, the Ukrainians have rotated uh, their soldiers back and forth to the Donbass region so they've got real-world experience with the Russians. This is making uh, the Russians look like they gambled, and the gamble looks like a loss. Jason, you know, putting this into perspective then, how much do you believe Vladimir Putin is willing to lose to ultimately win this war? Well, it, that is a great question from uh, Vladimir Putin's optic. Uh, it looks like he was always uh, interested in a shock and awe campaign that would scare Zelensky and company out of the uh, country, and then he could install a puppet regime. What I think he's willing to do is kind of negotiate his way at the end of this back to control of the Donbass, that's the eastern province region, so he's got that land bridge connection to Crimea. I think that's what his chief objective here is, uh, but I think he got a little bit uh, in front of his skis on this one, and now he's got to convince the Duma around him in the Kremlin uh, that this is worth staying in the fight. That's why you're seeing these desperation moves in cities like Mariupol or down as they're headed towards Mykolaiv and uh, Kharkiv and places like that. These are desperation attempts. The army is stalled out. It's winter time. The tanks are bogged down in the mud. Ukrainians have put up a fierce fight and uh, look for that to continue. Speaking of strategy, Russia has also been ramping up attacks on crucial port cities in Ukraine. Can you walk us through and elaborate more on the, the strategy by Russia there? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. So along the southern rim there, you've got a number of cities that control uh, ports, so bringing in uh, supplies and material goods. Odessa is the next one. Kherson was on the uh, the water there. They own the Crimean uh, peninsula that sits out in the Black Sea. So for them to split their forces now and to take out Odessa is going to actually reduce the number of combat forces that they can flex to the north along the Dnieper River headed towards Zaporizhia and uh, Kharkiv. In other words, they have a decision to make to split their forces and go left and right, east and west, or maintain their forces and try to take out Odessa with the hopes of choking off any of Ukraine naval supplies. But bear this in mind, the Ukrainians are not resupplying themselves from the water. So this is not necessarily an effective move in a mm. campaign that's relying on uh, resupply lines from Poland while also relying on battlefield recovery. That's when the Russian equipment goes into the hands of the U Ukrainians and the Ukrainians turn that around on the, on the Russians. So uh, the port, it's somewhat important, but the, the Ukrainians are not relying on that in this war right now. As we heard, Jason, in David Martin's piece, the Ukrainians are making good use of anti-tank weapons. They're also fighting on home turf. What else is working well for them? So those two are, are huge favors for them. I've talked about the three to one ratio. Sometimes it's five to one. If you are a defender defending your homeland and you have uh, one to every third of theirs, you're gonna put up a great fight. So their numbers are in their favor, the terrain, as you point out, the weather, uh, but mostly what's happening in their favor is the Russian army is not good at this. And I wanna point out something you don't hear a lot about. Vladimir Putin is a KGB agent. He's used to deception operations and clandestine operations and strike. This is war, this is open war. He is not a general. He has no military experience. The Russians, the most experience they've got is in places like Syria. Those are small war operations, so they are not good at this. And by the way, nobody's been good at this since World War II. Taking a city 
is not easy. And when we did it last, Baghdad, Kabul, Mogadishu, uh, we ourselves, the, Amer the United States Americans, found ourselves at the vulnerabilities of the insurgencies, guerrilla warfare, IED campaigns, sniper attacks. So this means all the advantages go to the, the, the folks in defense. That's the Ukrainians. All right, Jason Beardsley, put it into perspective for us. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks.